that's par for the course when we remote view is that mm -hmm. kind of similarity. Like the next target could be something completely different, could be a mountain somewhere and they'll, she'll draw a mountain. Like the similarity of it, of just using the technique and getting that information um, all, you know, it's in line with the targeting and it, it happens all the time. We do it every week. Everybody can do it. I've had people that Kate joined the group and said, I'll never be able to do this. And inside a month, they're doing it. And so this is a natural human phenomenon. A uh, part of the human experience is deciphering your intuition and accessing data, you know, from the ether or whatever you want to call it from subspace yeah. outside of time, whatever you want to call the name of it. I need to make a yeah. catch for it. They, you know, they they called it random. actually our grandfather called it the void and that's what the Native Americans call anything outside of physical Not or out, the void. In, in, yeah in between dimensions yeah. fair, fair enough and so get you know whatever whatever you want to call it so when you access data from it. Hey everyone, welcome to Shred the Veil. Daniel here with my brother Derek, and today we are going to be talking all about remote viewing. So recently, this was back in May, Derek and I presented at the Journey to Truth conference, and we talked all about our grandfather and his history and his book, and we also brought forward some new information that we've discovered. Uh, and some of it came from various different sources um, with information about our grandfather's history and his involvement in various high-level programs. And so um, we're going to be on a mission here in the next several episodes to share that information with everyone. Um, but one of the ones we really wanted to focus on right now, um, potentially one of the more credible ones, is the remote viewing that we had done through uh, Tony Rodriguez and his group of remote viewers. So I want to welcome Tony to the show. Hello. And also Thanks Veronica, one of the... Yeah, thank you, Tony. And one of the, uh, the remote viewers, Veronica. Um, and I guess we can just start this out... Um, just get a little background on what the remote viewing process is and how it all works. Uh, Tony, if you want to go through that, or Derek, if you want to talk about it. Please, Tony, yeah. Okay. Sure. Yeah. Um, so, it, you know, I, I've been on your show before along, like in my SSP testimony, and in digging up evidence and researching it, I came across that the very first program I was in was early remote advanced remote viewing research uh, experiments in the Inyo Kern facility. So I dug up, I, I went on a tear for a long time and uh, it dovetailed into what we were already doing in talks with Tony at my groups. We were doing a version of remote influencing that I always remembered when I got my memories back and it's called tier three. And we were doing remote viewing like as an exercise, like anecdotally, like just for practice, just for the fun of it. Like, hey, let's remote view and see what's in the bucket. And we got good at it. And so I, it's broke off and I started a remote viewing group to teach people. And I forget, you know, I had a bunch of people come through. And I did it for uh, a year and really got, got good at it. And what I, what I realized is we were getting great results. And some people that really, some people come in and do it for fun and they kind of hang out with the crowd. But some people really applied themselves and got very good at it. Veronica being one of them. There are many others in the group. And um, so I said, man, we can do this. We can. And then. Simultaneously, we got we got asked for for personal remote viewing sessions, and we got there was a missing girl, there was a missing persons, mm -hmm. and somebody said, "Can you remote view?" And then there were several. There were missing hikers. There were uh, cars stolen, and people were asking me to, "Can you have remote view?" And I said, "Well, my my beginner group, this isn't what we do. So you know, the group, I can't just." Call them up and have them remote view in an emergency, an adult situation where they might see somebody. You know, Nick, um, they might see something very violent or, or unsettling. Right. And so I thought, man, we can do this. The, I could take the best remote viewers I have and make a group, excuse me, the consistent ones, and make a group and then charge. And so we started what's called Motives. It's on my website, the Motives Remote Viewing Group, and it's first hire. And they're very good. Um, it changed. The, it took it to another level. We were able to to really use a lot, some, some more... Um, advanced techniques and a more standard approach to it and they got really good at it and right when i formed it you guys came along and said hey can you help we were getting ready to present in grafton at journey at the journey of the truth um rebels of disclosure conference was the name of it yeah. and you guys were like can you help us out with our grandfather find some info out of that and i said sure and 
I dragged my feet. I had so many projects going. Now the remote viewing group has really kind of matured and splintered off into actually four separate groups. There are three of them that it's a, I've made a, an entire curriculum to take somebody from zero to expert remote viewer. And it's doing yeah. quite well. It's actually been a success, very a successful thing. And I really love do. I really enjoy it. But the motives group I did at the last minute, kind of get your targets. So you gave me a bunch to look at. And it's because I wanted it to be double blind. I had to put it through another person and present it to the group. And then they needed time to individually do it. And I submitted, I really didn't have time to look through it. I was doing my own presentation and kind of getting on the road. It was, I think it was the, the week before the conference. I got the results to you. Right. It was close. Right. Yeah. yeah. And uh, you guys were, you know, you knew more about the target than I did. Basically I took your questions and what you wrote me up a P, like a PDF and I just made a, a couple of questions and I took the one that would be the most beneficial and ran it through the group. And you guys, you tell me what you think about the results of what happened. And, and Veronica's was um, one of the ones that you guys cleaned up on what, you know, I, I think I sent you six, six results of the viewings and hers was the one that kind of hit home to you guys. And so, uh, right. you know, but basically I, I just want to say for people that don't know, the viewer has no idea. It's just a set of numbers. They get a yeah, can we, can we go into that detail? So they, they just get a number. It's the, a random number. It's all they get. Yes, they get a random number. They have no clue. on. It could be another planet. It could be a boat at sea. It could be an amoeba. It could be a kitchen table and somebody. So they have no idea what the target is whatsoever. The odds of them getting any information that are anywhere near any of the things that you're asking are, astro which are not supposed to be. It's not supposed to happen. And every week, every single week, even the beginner group beats the one in 250,000 probability. We do it every single week. The protocol, it's based on the CRV protocol with a few other nuts and bolts. And it works. It just, it is, it's, it works. Everybody can do it. That is incredible. And so, so you said, so you picked one of the questions and you, did you kind of assign that a number somehow? Or how did that, how does the question tie to that? That's right. So you task it, you write in an envelope, you make a target package. Um, there's a few, there's a few do's and do's and don'ts on targeting. And we still, we, it's still an area of research. I think that a lot of the remote viewing classes that are out there nowadays teach you how to remote view great. They don't teach you how to target great. Like that's the mm. secret sauce because targeting okay. you, there's a, there's some really, um, there's some really magical things you can do with targeting. So you can have the people viewing things unbeknownst to them because the viewer is essentially trusting you. So targeting is something that's very, can be nuanced. And uh, so anyhow, yeah. So I made a target package. I took as much data as I could put it in an envelope and gave a random, I believe it was a six digit number at that time. It might've been a four, eight digit, but a random number to the group. And like I said, so the, to, to see your story, the context of what you wanted to know, and add the result, look at the results, they really shouldn't be that close at all. If you, if remote viewing isn't real, if the phenomenon doesn't, doesn't work, um, right. but, it does. Right. but it does. And it does every single week. Wow. Uh, That's amazing. so cool. And is it like you're setting an intention almost as you're, you're thinking about the question and writing the number at the same time or. So, so I've learned that some, we've had better results with an intention, the intention for the experience of the viewer. So the remote, it's, in other words, if I'm remote viewing a roller coaster, you know, at a Six Flag Park and I pick my favorite roller coaster and that's the target, I would write that. But on the back of it, I'd say it's my intention for the viewer to feel the happiness of people riding this ride, to connect with the emotions. And that's kind of like a beacon through what goes on there. There's a lot of different ways that you can, that you, there's a lot of different shades that you can put on the target packet. Um, right. But when you connect an emotional intention, it really does help them guide, find the way. Okay. So okay. Great. back at this time in the process with that, uh, I guess you're one of your more preliminary groups of remote viewers. What kind of targets were you guys generally doing at that time frame? Um, so the motives group does more um, is for, is for money. It's a business venture. The motives group we're trying to remote view. We're trying to either target financial products financial things to look at, to invest in. We've goofed around with some of that. We've done sports to try to do sports betting. We, um, you know, we're kind of honing in on it. And then we've done, we've done fine things that were lost, people that lost valuable things. And um, 
that they've lost them out in the woods and we're remote viewing where they're at. We've done things like that. We've done, like I said, missing persons. And, uh, you know, and then everybody, we all kind of have our thing. Like when we have nothing to do, hey, guys, there's no target this week. And they go, well, you know what? I want to see what happened to grandma. And can Tony, will you present my target to the group? And there's a lot of that shuffling goes around. You know, I think for the most part, we want to make money doing it with the motives group, but they just love doing it. Uh, these, you know, these people eat, eat, eat up targets for breakfast. They, mm -hmm. and when you, when you go through the process with the meditation and everything, and you, you access the data and then you get the reveal, it's a very rewarding feeling say, oh, wow, that's exactly what I saw. I had no idea because it's also kind of abstract. The data that you get is kind of abstract. I would say this, that remote viewing should be considered supportive and not conclusive. Mm. In other words, it's supportive evidence. It's not conclusive evidence. You still have to put your eyeballs on the target, a human being. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Like you have to, you can't just say, I remote viewed that so -and -so, you murdered somebody and now you go to jail. That's not, it doesn't work like that. It's abstract the way that a dream is not exactly, you can dream about something and it means totally something else because what you're interacting, whatever the process that you're interacting with the universe outside of time space is abstract thought abstract consciousness and so some things can represent other things the experience can be different this the way that hypnosis uh, sessions go they're not they're not verbatim uh, you know a lot of good information is uh, there's a lot of good information to be had but it's not verbatim you can't just say i saw a dinosaur it must be dinosaurs down there it's representing something else it can be representative it can be uh you know supportive evidence but not conclusive and so you have to it's only when we do several remote viewings that overlap when we when we get remote viewings and people say the same thing over and over again and it's completely random they have no idea what the other person said they have no idea what the target is and they're still saying the same thing over and over again then we have to support we have to act on that and say that you know what it's likely that this is the reality of the target yeah mm -hmm. Can you define what you mean when you say double blind? What exactly do you mean by that? So I create the target and then hand it off to somebody else who presents it to the group. Okay. So you're not directly. You know what that cuts? It cuts a version of telepathy that happens. So okay. if I make the target in the envelope and the group knows me and we all hung out and had dinner the night before and I present the thing, there's a, there's a form of telepathy, a subconscious telepathy that can happen and can mm -hmm. skew the results. They can, they would see the target from my perspective. Okay. So if I built, you know, if the target was uh, the Eiffel Tower and I was at the Eiffel Tower a month ago, then they yeah. would see my experience at the Eiffel Tower. But if it, if I was Eiffel Tower and I handed it to you, Derek, and then you had Daniel remote view, he would see a random, he, it wouldn't be connected to me. In other words, it's double blind. You're blind too. You don't, have, you don't know what the target is. And you're handing yep. it to him. So it kind of cuts off that possibility of telepathy. Um, what do you call it? Diluting the data. Okay. Yeah. Sorry, I had an energy drink, so I might be chatty. No, that's good. It's it's, it's very, uh, very informative. informative. Um, Veronica, can you tell us what it's like to be a remote viewer? Like, what is your process? When you get a number, what do you actually do? Like, how do you get into it? And what's, what does that look like? Um, my... Uh process is largely based on what Tony um, has given us in the groups. And I listen to about 15 minutes of binaurals. And uh, I work on a blank mind um, state. I have some uh, visualization tools I use. And uh, it helps me get into that blank mind state where I'm really not thinking of anything, or it's maybe a little thought here or there. And um, my my personal um, protocols, I, I'm basically, there's a moment where you can collect the data and it's like a split second. And Tony's described this to us in his groups and you can feel it when it comes and you're literally downloading everything within a split second. And that's when you do your first ideogram. And I think the first one I did with you was, uh, you know, space, uh, the uh, shape of a spaceship. So I, I draw that and then you go back in and you probe and you keep collecting data. Um, and usually it takes about 30 minutes to get most of the data for me. 
Um, I can go back in and get more, but the huge, the majority is in the first 30 minutes. And um, yeah, it's really important to practice uh, blank mind meditation. It's, uh, I was working as a psychic online for some time, so I um, had tools I was using as well. And, um, and I already had validation that what I was seeing was a lot of the time real. So that's the other thing um, that Tony talks about as well, is that when you believe you can do it, when you have the validation, it, you start getting better and better. So, mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. Makes sense, uh, yeah. And, and so that first download, is that kind of, do you, do you kind of go back to that moment or that those feelings and everything kind of draws back to that first like hit, I guess, that you come to? Absolutely. And it's in the ideogram. So whatever you draw as the remote viewer, you're putting all that data there. So you can go back in with a pen or your finger and tune back in and keep extrapolating some of the data that's in there. Okay. Cool. Um, all right. I guess we can start to look at some of the results with our grandfather here. Uh, all right. But yeah, before... I'm Go ahead, I, was gonna just, I was just going to say, too, that when Tony emailed me back, it was just, you know, a few days later and he emailed, emailed me back and he said, well, let's have a quick call. We need to talk about this. And he was just kind of like excited and kind of he couldn't believe it. He's like, this is a lot of stuff coming in. And he, he was like impressed at his own group that like they actually <laughs> had these results coming in. He's like, wow, you you really have to check this out. And he wanted to confirm that it made sense to like, you know, what we were trying to get, what we we're trying to pull from. And uh, it definitely, they're definitely connected the dots for us too. Yeah. So that's great. I'm uh, looking at what I sent here. So it was a long time ago for me and I've lost a lot of the data. It's all buried in a pile of remote viewings that I have on my, my computer. But um, I knew from what you had told me. And then when I saw the results of everybody coming in that we had got really got the target, we had connected with the data and it wasn't a ricochet. And I, I knew that it was going to be useful for you guys. So, um, right. and what, like I said, I it's a great feeling. Right. And we didn't ask, we didn't ask you, what's the question that you used? <laughs> for um, that? Well, I'm trying to dig it up. Um, I'm trying to dig <laughs> it up right now because I had three of them set up and I just, because we ran short on time, we were close to the conference. I took the one that um, I thought I'd get the most data from. Um, I'm and looking at all the emails were, between us right now. Yeah. I thought you told me that it was um, how many in, how many encounters was it uh, where he had interaction with ETs or UFO or interaction with ETs? It was kind of like what was it was almost like the how, asking the number how many something like that. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> yeah, you know, I wish I had it right here. I just don't have it. Um, well, I think well, that was one of the questions. Yeah. Okay. Sorry, I yeah, think well, it, it was something like that. Like, how often did, and I named your grandfather by name, how often did he interact with extraterrestrials and where? Or it was something like that. How often did he interact? Or did he even, in fact, um, I think that was what you guys wanted. So there, I, it was the first thing that you asked me. Yeah. Too. Yeah, exactly. Um, man, like, I, I don't know where it's at. I'll pull up the email. Some of my own results here. Yeah, if you could. While you guys are doing that, real quick, I, I, before we get into it, I would like to kind of brief any viewers that aren't familiar with our grandfather's story on you know why we were asking about this in the first place. So, in case you're not familiar with our background, um, our grandfather uh, it was Daniel Morris Salter, and he was born in 1928. He served in the Air Force from 1947 through 1968. And then he became an operative in the NRO, the National Reconnaissance Office, um, basically until, until he passed away. Um, and so uh, during his career, um, he claimed to have seen um, a UFO, or it's three UFOs. His first encounter was in 1949. Uh, he was a radar specialist, and he, he saw them. They painted on the radar, and he, they were just sitting still, and then they, also, they took off like 3,000 miles per hour. And they actually got real photographs of it too. Um, so that kind of got him into various higher levels of top secret clearances throughout his career, starting his career off with something like that. And eventually he claims that he got a Cosmos clearance, which is 38 levels above top secret. And he, and he was in the NRO, which is a 
secretive organization at the time didn't become public until the mid late 90s um and then in 2001 he came forward as one of the 21 witnesses in dr stephen greer's disclosure project uh in the national press club in washington dc uh, ex-military and um i guess uh, any kind of aerospace individuals came up and gave testimonies about their encounters with extraterrestrials ufos and things like that and uh, in his testimony he talked about you know contact with with U ets uh, ufo crashes particleization time travel things like this and then two years later he came out with a book called life with a cosmos clearance where he went into great detail about the history of the ufo phenomena when the, in the 1900s starting back with uh, the germans uh, pre-world war ii so and it, it expands a lot of different topics all over the place and um so Derek and I growing up, we saw our grandfather maybe once a year in the summertime. We went to visit him and I he we kind of got a little bit of information when we were teenagers of him telling us some stories about UFOs and we didn't really know what to think of it at the time or if it was true or if anyone really believed anything he was saying. Uh but then as he came out with the disclosure project and we learned more of his involvement, um, he was actually on a decline declining health at the time. He had some mini strokes and he passed away shortly after. So we, unfortunately we never had a chance to really to him in depth about any of this information that he presented in his book or his testimonies with the disclosure project so there's a lot of um this unknowns for us so in the last 20 years it's kind of been our journey to find any cooperating information we can and to you know discover what the real truth is of, of his career and things like that so we've gone through a different a lot of different routes and avenues rabbit holes to try to find that and so we were very excited with this remote viewing opportunity when we heard that this was an option so that's so why just yeah, go ahead. Yeah, just one other key point. And like he was part of disclosure project with Dr. Greer. We haven't we never even got to see the original footage that was recorded in in 2000 before yeah, that was the year 2000. We never even saw the original footage which was at least a couple hours worth of him talking. We only got to see the clips that were edited and put into, you know, based on the book and then based on the DVD set that Dr. Greer had. But I'd ask through email and even in person to Dr. Greer. And he kind of just shrugged me off like, I'll oh, just go to the website. And I was like, obviously I, I, I still am looking for the answers. So we just now, he just released that information. So even up until just this year, we never actually got to hear his full testimony given to the disclosure project and what was in there and all the stuff in there. So um, wow. that's how much we, he really didn't divulge to us, you know, as, as he was getting older, he, he just didn't. But it, until he wrote the book and then we we're just like okay there's the book and but what do we <laughs> how do we piece it together so anyhow i did find the question so i did find oh the good question. good um, i was gonna say i was gonna add to that that uh i don't know if any of you are familiar with uh the space force book that dr michael sala wrote but it tells the history of how the nro was um basically absorbed yeah, kennedy started the national reconnaissance office to try to mm -hmm. supplant the space assets from the CIA. And after he was shot, the CIA gave all their space assets to the NRO and then they assumed control of the NRO. So uh, there's so that office was is very you know there's a huge paper trail. There's a lot of data around the NRO being the space branch of the CIA. I didn't uh, I didn't realize okay. that. Wow. Oh wow. In the book The Space Force, he tells the history of it, the funding a lot. It's that he really did a fine job researching that. And I would recommend that book. Uh, it, it explains the funding behind the secret space program in the beginning, in the early days. Like the CIA had full-time surveillance of the globe in 19, in the seventies, in the early seventies, far right. better than what we have today. And what we think we do in the digital cameras, they had full-time manned space stations made with the Gemini project that had yeah. surveillance of the entire globe uh, with, um, uh, you know, a million megapixels or something, you know, a million pixels worth of de imaging. So in the 70s, the CIA had this. That's crazy. And you, you see the book's called one... Space Force, is the name of the book? Space Force, yep. Yeah. Space Force. Space Force. I have his books, but I don't have that one. But the story that actually that I've heard now a couple times is that Nixon uh, asked a question when he was president or something like, hey, how good is your surveillance? Or what do you guys have? And they said, well, go step outside your door. And like, they like zoomed in on him and told him exactly like what he had in it, what he's wearing and all that stuff. Like it was. Yeah. So, so, what, 
what they found was that so back then in the seven they didn't have digital cameras. So like the satellites couldn't go up and use reel to reel. Like Thomas Edison took a two million pixel picture. When you when you chemically develop film, it's actually very high quality compared to what we're used to. And so they put manned manned space station, the 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 von Braun spinning station. They had three of them in orbit in the seventies. The CIA did with stealth with screens around them so you can't see them. And they had yeah. film labs and they're taking pictures with chemicals, chemical film developing on the <laughs> spots. They had real time surveillance of the globe. So if you think about that, and then the funding of it, the CIA's got an eighty million dollar budget, but they had after nine eleven they got audited. And for those three years of uh, 2001, 2002, and 2003, they were spending over a trillion dollars a year. So they had the receipts for a trillion dollars. They were getting $80 million in. So they there's cer certainly a secret um, economy that they have. And if you had surveillance of the globe, it could be pretty easy to make money. Uh, yeah. Anyhow, that's a different story. But what I would say is check out the, the NRO, the history of the National Reconnaissance Office, is very integral for what you're saying in your grandfather was a part of it back then. He was directly in line for the secret space program that was dictated by the CIA. Wow. Wow. That, yeah, that, I told that, you that, it was yeah. chatty. No, that's that great. <laughs> that's good. That's a lot no, of information. That we were always trying to find the best way to present the NRO to people because people ask, you know, what was it? And, you know, it's always very vague or what we're able to find. So that's, we're definitely going to check that out. <laughs> wow. Yeah, and it helps because I've heard that even our grandfather said something about Eisenhower wanted it to be civilian and he wanted to get it away from the CIA. But I guess, like you're saying, all that didn't work out too well in the end of the day. But um, but I have the questions here, so we can jump into that and start looking at that. I think the background is very useful, and I think people need to hear that just in case they weren't aware of who he was. So I had four questions I'm guessing you probably only, Tony, you probably just took the first one maybe, but the first one was how many times did Daniel Morris Salter directly encounter extraterrestrial beings or crafts and what was his involvement with them? And then I asked like a sub bullet and what years was he involved in case that was possible? I think I did it without the years. It was that question, but without the, what years was he involved? It was what, yeah. what was his role and did, you know, and I, I, um, not sure if I worded it in a manner that left it like is did he work with extraterrestrials? Uh, right. But it was how many times did he encounter? What was his duties? What was his? What was he doing? It was something like that, so, like a spin on that first question. I don't. I think that was it. <clears throat> that was perfect, and that's really the that's really what we wanted to get to. The other ones I happen to have um, had to do with time travel and what asking about the, his role in that and what particleization is involved with that because we knew the term what was tied together so so that one i i remember when i looked at that that i i wasn't sure how the data would play out and i didn't want to confuse the viewers so this mm -hmm. being said also in a remote viewing situation the simpler you can keep the question the better the data so that some people sense. we take turns uh, i let people in the group create targets so they can learn how to do it and some people, they 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 go, here's my chance. I might not make another target for the group. So they make a target that's got five targets in. And the data just comes out all over the place. It's it's really hard to distinguish what's what. So to keep it, keep it. And I think that second one, when you're talking about time travel, like, I mean, you can bake your brain on that one. So I, that's why I chose the other one. Makes sense. That makes sense. And then the last, the last two were actually involved in what organizations? One being the NRO, one being the ACIO, and the other one was the Interplanetary Phenomenon Scientific and Technical Counterintelligence Unit. It's a very long name. Um, and that was what we knew from um, day after Roswell and um, Colonel Corso and uh, William Tompkins, actually. All of those, I guess, like Colonel Corso for sure put it in his book and mentioned that was the big one related to UFOs. So. Anyhow, I'm glad we stuck with the first one. And so let's, yeah, let's check out what we got. <laughs> Veronica, do you want to share it or do you want me to do it? Sure. Yeah, I'm happy to share. Okay. Let's see. So um, the beginning, uh, so the first ideogram that I got was uh, a similar shape of a saucer. 
And then um, as I probed more, we're looking at the storyboard. So we're trying to get an idea of what is happening within um, the picture of what you're seeing. And so for the location, I was seeing a, a, a saucer-shaped um, ship come in and there were it was in a remote location with uh, uh, mountains in the background. And I got a clear storyboard of, um, I didn't know it was your grandfather, but bringing him out. So there were a couple people that brought him out and the, the state was interesting because he, 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 he was surprised. This might've been his first time, um, but he wasn't uh, clueless. Like he, he knew it was going on, but it was still dumbfounding to see. And, mm. um, so they bring him out and the, the the ship, when he entered, it took him in. It changed, it did something. It looked like it glitched or it had some kind of technology, um, got kind of blurry, bringing him up. And then the next scene was them walking down can a you, long can hall. Can you feel that? We're not sorry. Share, can you try to share your screen again? We're not seeing it. You want me to uh, share my screen? Oh, I, I, I was going to ask you. Ah, you, you, uh, yeah, let me, I, I can do that. Sure. I mean, I. There we go. How's that? Is that working? Perfect. No. Yeah. Great, great. Okay. So let me go back to the top. So this was the um, ideogram here, the first. So that's where I collected. You know, the the entire amount of data is in that, and wow. then I would go back and probe that um, for more information. And so there was the location of, and there's the saucer shape with the mountains in the background. Um, Interesting too, the e-temp is fun. This is uh, something that Tony puts in when he wants um, information from uh, for other things. Uh, so that's kind of a side thing. But that's is um, that like is that your body temperature while you're doing the viewing, or what is that? How would you describe it, Tony? Well, it's an emotional temperature, so not yeah. the temp kind of like the temperature of the room, but um, emotionally. So. If you're if you're witnessing a bunch of people around a, a, a in a room, and you see an interaction, is, are they angry? Are they relaxed? What is the emotional temperature? And it works right. like that. So there are other things that we do. You know, are they happy? Are they sad? Are they hungry? Thirsty? Are they? Does, is it smelly? Like, what is the condition of the emotions of the people there? They're easy to tune in on. And there's mm -hmm. a few other things. So that's a. Um, piggyback targeting is something i touch i touch about it in my book it's one of the things but um i don't want to get into a big long side discussion here um but it's very useful it's very useful okay. in other finding other aspects of the target mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah i mean it definitely to the emotional temp skyrockets because of uh the storyboard here at the bottom so there he is brought out um, witnessing what's coming towards him and then him going inside um, with the blurry, um, the ship kind of changing shape in a way. And there he is going down with two rather tall looking beings uh, uh, down a long hallway. Um, and he's brought in for uh, some kind of uh, medical procedure. And uh, he, he was, there was some pain, um, uh, but it was different. Sometimes we have remote viewed things uh, of research facilities or abductions, and it's pretty horrific what mm -hmm. happens. Um, and this, it wasn't that. There was something he kind of knew. He knew in a way, or he at least wasn't, again, dumbfounded. He was not confused about what was going on. It was like preps um, to do it, I guess, maybe. He, like, he, he knew he was going to get into it. Yeah, it it seemed like he he knew he you know and from what I gathered it was just a very strong individual. This was not a, a victim. This was not yeah somebody who was being victimized. Um, but nevertheless, I don't think he was entirely happy about what he knew he had to do. Um, okay. So what that could be, I in the next page with. Uh, some of these more descriptors, um, he did have pain in his head and some worry. So maybe there was the, a medical procedure um, within his head. Uh, who knows what that could be? Um, 
But here, really, the most important are um, his emotions I was tapping into. That's very clear. The amazement, the awe of what was happening, even though, you know, he was uh, well-versed in uh, in his field, still this, this was particularly awe-inspiring. Um, there was a bit of, like, queasiness, uh, sickness. Um, it could have been from being in the craft. Um the let's see here i think that the only yeah the words that came in was abduction something like sky corp something so i don't know if that has any importance the so we do a second ideogram in the motive so we kind of clear our uh space we go back into the blank mind meditation and i pull a a, a second ideogram and this one didn't really have any relevance to what the the shape, it was really just a, a random symbol. But this was afterwards, after he'd gone through all these things, he was brought into this big kind of hall or council room. I was uh, inside, I, I don't, the kind of a grand meeting. And it was really interesting. When he was standing in the middle, there was a discussion about how to move forward with him. And he had an he wasn't afraid and he was very, uh, uh, very courageous, um, e extremely intelligent, uh, confident. He knew a lot. There was something about, he also wasn't really afraid to die. He like, there was nothing. He was a bit, um, I don't know how to put it, but just very, very strong. And they were looking at him and, uh, asking him questions, deciding what to do. And um, the beings, I, I don't believe that they were humanoid. I don't believe they were humans. Um, so this was a very important meeting him. And then kind of, I describe more of what I saw on the last page as kind of a compression of all the data. Um, there was like plans, discussion. This was a very important moment. Um, the abduction was to gather more information from him. Um, it was an elite group. The target was being taken in your grandfather, it looked like, and question. And there could have been some intimidation um, as well to to try and get him in a, in a scared state. He did have, of course, this underlying... Uh, he was questioning it was like he was prepared to die there mm -hmm. was this and so it wasn't scared like he was afraid they were going to hurt him it was just our normal of being prepared to to leave and to end your life um so but he was taken into the fold i think it was a some kind of initiation where he was brought um into a, a higher level and they it might have been i i heard that it was he might have become a liability like he knew too much and he needed to be brought into a more uh, structured and protected atmosphere um and how also he could be of use because they were very eager to use him once they got him in onto their level and their platform and I, I think that was it. I think, and the seven I got uh, here, I wrote. So I, that could have been the amount of times that he was taken up into this particular ship. So or, uh -huh. I want to interrupt a little bit. I want to say this yeah. in your presentation, you showed remote viewing from other teams, and the number seven kept coming up in your presentation. I noticed we were sitting in the back watching you guys on stage, and I said, there's another seven. And it wasn't ours, it was a whole other remote viewing team. They said they had seven. They had written things on the bottom and there were seven of them. And then in another page of data, there was another seven. And then she got a seven. And I think in some of uh, a few other of our viewers, there was a, the number seven came up. So it kept coming up. It was a reoccurring data point. Wow. Okay. Okay. So, and so that was the, that was basically it you said from that. That's right. That's yeah. Lot. Yeah. That was, a, that's a lot of information to come in <laughs> for sure. Uh, yeah, what, uh, yeah. Just real quick, the question about he was being brought into that room, the round circular room, and the beings around him. You said they most likely were 
like extraterrestrial. They probably weren't human, right? Yeah. Okay. And yeah, that, I'm just kind of curious. Like he, to me, it seems like a very, uh, I don't know. It doesn't seem like a very excite, like a very happy place to be. Like it's almost like it was he, almost like an ambassador or some somehow being used by by uh, by our government or whatever to say, well, here you go. Let's see how they take you and like if you you can help decide, I guess, or like you. Let's see how they handle it. Like either either they'll accept you or they won't. But then we'll use you as the scapegoat or the guinea pig in this whole thing, maybe. Yes. Yeah. It was he was aware of what was going on. He 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 wasn't again clueless. He knew the risks and and some of the games that were being played. Yeah. Mm -hmm. He he was. Yeah. I, I imagine what he has shared and in, in you have shared is you know a fraction of of what he's seen and experienced. And even when he got to this point, he'd seen a lot and he knew a lot. And for some reason, it was, it was a good thing, but also uh, a liability. That's that's what it felt like, yeah. Wow, yeah. yeah. Well, we know that he was, uh, I, one of the reasons we, we probably think he was brought into some of these inner circles in the government was because he was a Mason and his grandfather was a 33rd degree Mason. And so those ties are likely yeah. one reason, but I'm yeah. sure he mentioned any, of course he would never have mentioned anything, anything close to a contact like this personally, but he mentioned that when he was getting screened and when to get the higher clearance levels, you had to go through very, 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 very um, like, uh, what do you call it? Arduous, like uh, long, long testing process for psychological psych testing, all kinds of different, yeah, yeah, psychology. Wow. So he mentioned like it was a rigorous process. He's never been through any tests like that before. So he made it sound like they really, really see: Are you the type of person that you know not only can like handle the fact that you're going to see encounter other beings, but like, yes, will, will you will you play by our rules? <laughs> I think yes. That was yeah, yeah, that sounds that sounds very yeah right on the nose. Well, it was a it was my honor to be able to connect with him and kind of feel his emotions and his thoughts. It was really uh, an experience. He was a really incredible man. So it wow. was my pleasure. Thank yeah. you so much. <laughs> and well, it's interesting too. I mean, we can keep Dan. If there's other questions you have about this, please feel free to ask. But I think it's interesting that we had somebody. Uh, connect to our grandfather actually while we presented at that conference. And that was, that's something that we're still trying to um, kind of get more details about, but, but yeah. apparently that, that did occur. <laughs> so in like a, a mediumship kind of way during the, the, the conference, that was kind of crazy. Oh, really? Uh, yeah. Yeah. We, we, we definitely want to expand on that. It's, 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 it's pretty fascinating. I've been in contact with her for the last several months since the conference uh, with me wow. through to her. And it's like, pretty remarkable a lot of the details that she'll get that are very personal like family things to you know validate stuff that she's hearing and then a lot of it is stuff that she's not sure she really she doesn't really understand it's that's more kind of kind of along the lines of some kind of government kind of information or something like that so wow wow yeah, incredible we're still kind of trying to dissect that and try to figure that out so it's kind of exciting yeah oh great and um, can, can i ask you one other question that came up, I just thought about, well, did you get any idea or sense of the time period of this event? If it was just the one event or if maybe multiple or when would you feel like it happened? I'll, uh, the actual time, like the year that you, is that? Yeah. Or decade or like if there of any way of no, not really knowing that. I would say I knew I wasn't, this wasn't a current, like a very, that was close to our time. I would say I, I did feel I was uh, in I, in the past at a mm -hmm. distance for, for sure. Um, wasn't a future event. It wasn't something that happened in the last de decade. It was before. Right. Um, and as far as I, I felt like this was part of a, a sequence of what was going to be happening. This wasn't the end. This was some kind of beginning for him a, a, or a new, a new chapter for sure. Wow. 
-hmm. Yeah. So this and, is kind of weird, but uh, I just and I just noticed this while you were talking and showing these pictures. Can you scroll down to the one with the in person in the middle and the people around the outside? And then, okay, perfect, right there. And then the ideogram there um, with the, it's like, it's almost, it's almost like a V shape. And then it's got like rays coming out of it, this second thing. Um, I'm going to share my screen real quick just to show this because I just think this is kind of wild. And I don't know why it popped in my head, but um, I just. <laughs> Should I hit the stop share? Uh, yeah, go ahead. Okay. So Derek and I have done a lot of uh, interesting episodes. and. Um, one of the ones we've we've done with uh, one of the ACIO members was looking back at um, the German history with UFOs and the secret societies, the cold societies that they had back then. Uh, so our grandfather talks a lot about that in his book, a lot of detail about that. Um, and so that that V one, um, it made me think of this here. Uh, this and this is an image I had on my computer because we were doing, um, you know, using it for the show just to show some things. But this is oh wow, this is the oh, my God. This is one of the esoteric uh, occult um, societies from Nazi Germany that were the first ones to really get into the extraterrestrial, not the, the, the anti-gravitational technology. When they first come up with their, their ships and things like that, it all spawned from this and channeling that occurred with these two channels that they had uh, within the society. And they were the, they were ones responsible for all the, um, the different aspects of it. They started with, a, they tried to figure out time travel and it led into anti-gravitation and all the craft that they've they come up with since then so that kind of wow. stood out to me oh yeah i absolutely that that blows and, my mind yeah and the next next image that we happen to use for our show when we're when we're showing these things uh is this here so you have something in the middle and you have everyone circling around it and this is the image that took my eye when you first showed that the people surrounding it so you know and if especially if he was like being interrogated or, or you know he was within this some kind of place you didn't want to be and wow. people kind of you know, trying to assess them or something. I don't know. That just kind of clicked. Oh, absolutely. Chill. Absolutely. Yeah, it it could definitely be. Um, it could have been, it could still have been on a spaceship for sure, a reproduction uh, of what can be done also on Earth, you know. Um, yeah. Yeah. Wow. And, then, yeah, and this, the, yeah, yeah, the, the V shape here and then, like the, the black sun behind it with the rays emanating out like that like that, your, your symbol had the v going into like some kind of explosion looking thing so and, and the circle yeah. with the with the runes around it is the same yeah oh thing. wow yeah that, so that, that's wow i don't know I, and i i honestly hadn't looked at this material since we gave the presentation so that just got, occurred to me you know Wow. Well, I have to talk with you guys more. So Tony knows, but I'm trying to finish a book and I'm doing a lot of research right now about where the Nazi regime went, uh, especially in Latin America and how they might have been working with the U.S. government um, and all of the atrocities that have happened there over the last five decades. So I'll have to ask you about that another time. That's really yeah, interesting. Yeah. Oh, wow. Wow. Wild, Thank you yeah. for sharing. That's great. It's wild. Yeah, that... um, anyway, let me. Uh... So, and that's the kind of stuff I think that's what, that's what I'm saying. That like, that's par for the course when we remote view is that mm -hmm. kind of similarity. Like the next target could be something completely different, could be a mountain somewhere and they'll, she'll draw a mountain. Like the similarity of it, of just using the technique and getting that information, um, all you know it's in line with the targeting and it, it happens all the time we do it every week everybody can do it i've had people that came join the group and said i'll never be able to do this and inside a month they're doing it and so this is a natural human phenomenon a uh, part of the human experience is deciphering your intuition and accessing data you know from the ether or whatever you want to call it from subspace yeah. outside of times so whatever you want to call the name of it i need to make a yeah. catch for it they you they, know, they called it random. actually our grandfather called it the void and that's what the native americans call anything outside of physical or the uh, void. In, yeah in between dimensions yeah. fair, fair enough and so you, you know whatever whatever you want to call it so, so when you access data from it it's there and it's it's you, 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 everybody you know, 
something really trippy. This is really weird because I just for my birthday was recently I went to go see uh, Wolverine and Deadpool or Wolverine versus that whatever that movie is just a stupid movie to go watch. Right. But I thought it'd just be fun to watch. And guess what they use as the term they go to like for this time travel thing and like going to other world is the void. They're like, oh, well, you go into the void. void. Yeah, Yeah, it's it's like the prison zone, prison dimension or whatever. Yeah. Yeah. It like tripped me out when I heard them start using that. I feel like they're they're literally trying to start use these terms and everything the else. And first Deadpool it. movie had disclosure, <clears throat> had the <clears throat> oxygen deprivation tank where he went. Oh, yeah. And that was something directly that I disclosed before that. And I was like seeing it in a movie, like in a fancy way. And I'm thinking, this is terrible that they they give us these things so that when somebody says it, they go, oh, well, you got it from that movie. Yep. And uh, but the movies are late now. The information's come out earlier than the movies. You know, we got ahead of Hollywood for a short time, and yeah. uh, you know, we'll we'll see how it, how it pans out. But Hollywood is fully aware. There are people inside that make movies that are fully aware of what's really going on in these programs. Oh yeah, they must be. Yeah, for sure, they must be. So, um, we'll, what do you want to ask? Go for it, Dan. I was, yeah, please. I was going to say, Derek, if you want to walk through the remaining remote viewers that Tony had in his group real quick and their results just to show like what the different people saw. Um, sure. Do yeah, that. I can make it. Well, well, the similarities of it. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. right. Yeah. It's worth it for sure. Veronica, how long have you been? Can I ask how long you've been when you started the remote viewing? When oh. did I join you? Was that in November of last year, December? Right after the October, November, uh, right in that time frame. Yep. Yeah. So pretty, I mean, I'm pretty new to it. I Yeah. That's literally yeah. like almost six months from when you did this one, basically, right? Yeah. That's yeah. crazy. <laughs> yeah. It's, yeah. It, it's, uh, yeah. Using that, that blank mind meditation is so good for so many things, for uh, recall of memories, for uh, doing psychic work, remote viewing. And so I was pretty serious about uh doing the work and also doing what tony recommended and it worked so and i really it's really fun i really enjoy it very much huh? really. i said all shucks you're giving me, <laughs> you're making me it's, blush. it's yeah. true <laughs> yeah okay we'll go through it real kind of quickly but i mean people yeah, me, will get uh, the idea. get to the next slide here that was that was veronica's yeah and then yeah okay <clears throat> so yeah, a lot of what I could see as similar similarities were the um, like underground or tunnel, um, uh, kind of like a. I think the la- the next two are more based, kind of similar like that. Uh, Multi levels underground is showing kind of on the right, on the bottom there, going fast, very fast in the tunnel. Um, yeah, um, so like an underground base tunnel system, um, all the. All the things on the see on the left, I get that Im- ideogram is interesting, but um, yeah, the mountains, uh, train going through tall steps, stairway tracks, underground, Colorado mountains, base, inner earth, lower levels, ETs frequent area. It, those were the story, it's kind of storyboard. So ET, ETs frequent the area, okay? So, and like in our grandfather's book, he talks about Cheyenne Mountain, Colorado, as being like the head to the headquarters of the star wars program inside the mountain um where basically it's the it's the focal point of the military industrial complex from you know, back in the 80s when he was in it in, in it um and that little uh timeline i guess the cooler warmer temperature thing it looks pretty cold wherever they are like it make it emotionally like a cold place too right so maybe that's what it's saying with the circle there I don't know. so then this one again too is Looks like they mentioned uh, can't go any deeper, but it's underground. Uh, many cameras scanning, lots of activity within that space. Military uniforms, um, something like Matrix. Uh, it's very busy. Need to focus there. Um, but then all the things on the left, like the feelings and emotions, seeing blurry bits, full streaming blocked swish movement hearing swish movement i got underground again in the space entrance and has an entrance and fake cover above the ground sage smell of sage so like desert probably outdoor smell 
possible vegetation, but more austere, cool lang uh, words are language below top of top of ground, mundane words, something like that. Okay. So lots of activity there in that one air, one, uh, one slide. There's a lot of words in description in this, but uh, again, mountainous Colorado area, underground facilities, transport system, multi-level, higher tech, um, elevator system down, um, need to check in with the card, need to be scanned to get in. Uh, that I remember another one was basically you need a badge, you need some clearance to get through. Elevators like steel color with bright white lights. Bottom that illuminate illuminate compartments like on Star Trek, Star Wars, I guess maybe it lights up when you're walking through it or something. Might be getting screen memory, something vast underground. Uh, go through systems, large operations, many levels of clearance partial view only partial view allowed don't feel these are the bad don't feel these are the baddies so maybe just who knows what government projects or what groups tan dark gray black green white reflective surface breathing pushed importance of tracking much data being processed many levels in si in simul simultaneity simultaneity quantum fast interesting paradox around area around his normal pace but this pace is fast so well, what a lot of data and like i said it all supports what we know the target is so this person yeah. had no, no idea what we were talking about or you know this is a double blind you know the intake was just a set of numbers so the the, the supporting evidence is amazing yeah yeah it really it's crazy so and that was the second one and this is the third one i think this is the only slide i i, I put together and it was not as much data coming in, but an open area. Obviously, you see a couple mountains. Looks like it goes underground. Um, I'm not sure with the timeline thing with the cold 30 days, all that's what is that really? But somewhat open land, rocky, brown colors, tan colors, open cavity fills out of the country, maybe. The, the storyboard's interesting. It looks like obviously you're going down levels, uh, something in a mountain, an opening into the mountain. Like, I don't know if the third one's supposed to be like a, you can make that, I don't know, like you're going fast through something, look, like maybe a tunnel, maybe some pathway. And the, yeah. And the fourth one is that, that person looking kind of in a weird, weird little outfit. Um, mm. looks like a, could be like a spy or whatever, who knows something interesting. Um, well, I, I mean, very... that, that's amazing how that, this one aligns with a lot, the second one, which is completely different, you know, different person, you know? The overlap is stunning. Yeah, yeah, it's overlap. Yeah, it's stunning. Crazy. Yeah. So same stuff over there with the underground, everything. He, they think maybe Peru came up, like maybe it's a different country. Um, uh, what else on the right? Colors brown, tan, silver, greenish. Uh, ozone, ozone smell. Air is still, feels like an old site. Um in the country barren on the surface below there's open space that's hidden maybe like a memory of this area all almost forgotten letters m and p and peru m and p i wonder maybe that's like military police or who knows what or i'm thinking if it's peru like machu picchu or something yeah hmm. yeah. yeah there's no telling there could be overlay there it's you could be getting anything in there so it's just stuff that's there for, in case there's another overlap. You know, if you dig it up, then it'll be supportive. Like mm -hmm. I said, supportive evidence, not conclusive. And it's interesting, like, you don't have to, like, all sit down and be like, okay, everybody start doing your remote viewing now. And, like, you're not all simultaneously gathering data. You do it at your own time, at your own pace when you want to, right? Right. They post it. And then, so for the motives group, we, we you know, time, the... The time frame matters. It does come into play, but that's there are more advanced things that are at play there. So you can't uh, uh, you you know from the time you create the target to the time you view it is a little sensitive. So they try to get it. They always try to get them knocked out in a couple in a day or two. Um, the faster the better. So uh, that was the case. I, we were down to the last week. I think two weeks before the conference, and I got the target done and then forwarded to you. And yeah. uh, I had my hands full. I was juggling a bunch of other stuff at the time, as usual. Um, but I was happy with the results and I'm glad that you guys, I mean, hopefully this, I mean, you tell me like, hopefully this connects a few dots for you guys that 
at bare minimum, because of the overlap from individuals, I mean, it's a lot of supportive evidence. It supports what you already knew. Yeah. It's yeah. A lot of validation is. for sure. Yeah. It's, it's amazing. And probably This is probably one of the strongest of all the sources that we've gotten that, you know, we, we don't really know. You can't really, the sources that we, uh, we'll, we'll explain that later, but I mean, some say they have access to the secret space program databases and if they're part of the ACIO or not, or are, are there alters getting information, you know, like there's no way to validate that information. But if this is so, this, this data is the most unbiased of any data you could possibly get basically um, without being able to say, you know, have some proof videotape or something to say, this is what happened. Right. So. Right. So when we do, when in the groups, when we do confirmable targets, so if I make the target my living room and the people send me the data, I can confirm it. I'm looking at the living room. I can say, oh, there it is. Yep. You got it. You actually got it. This is an unconfirmable target. So what we're looking for is overlap. You know, the, like I said, the several people saying the same thing. Everybody said underground. Everybody had ETs and advanced technology. So all of them have that. So out of randomness, out of the randomness of the targeting, it's very unlikely that that would be the case if it weren't right. true. So right. it's just unlikely. Single that random number. Yeah. Yeah. Crazy. Yeah. The, the underground, uh, obviously, it was something important as well. It didn't quite answer the question, but uh, it's. I'm wondering too if what I saw when I did the second ideogram, I because I was in a blank mind, uh, and I assumed it was in the spaceship because I, I. But it was two different readings, and I'm wondering if I tuned into that. Maybe it happened sequentially. Maybe he. Mm. That was really important that it came through. Um, mm -hmm. Part and part of his story, I think. Yeah. 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 And I, I don't know if we asked you, but when you saw him go into the spaceship and you, it, it, I guess it kind of blurred, but did you feel like that he was taken off? Like it's, it was going up, it was going out some off planet or did it feel like it's actually. I, I didn't feel like he traveled that much. Um, I feel like he was pretty close, but still something changed so that there was that queasiness that, mm. that, something shifted in the atmosphere um that that he had to deal with yeah um yeah but i'm still i my my mind is moving now because i'm wondering about the underground thing how that plays in to the whole experience and it could very well be connected yeah that right well, after that he was transferred for his new chapter in right. these underground facilities right yeah. Yeah, and we know really from the, the Dulce, we know from Phil Snyder, we know from just testimony everywhere that obviously at certain levels you're interacting more or less with other beings, not just humans, and, yeah. and, and probably stuff that we've created some crazy hybrid things too, which are yeah, insane Absolutely. to think about. Yeah. yeah, it's a great, it's a great story, great testimony. It's yeah. super interesting, and it's it it's, is. It's a lot of, um, I bet he's happy. I, you know, I bet he would want you guys to do what you're doing, yes. right? After seeing all the things he saw and knowing what the world is like and what people like, it's, it's you guys have really carried on his work in a way that uh, I think is meaningful to do what he always wanted to do, but agreed to not speak about it, you know? Right. right. So it's like you guys are actually, uh, what you're doing here is real important. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I can't wait to hear you speak again, do your presentation. I it was great to hear you in Journey to Truth. Um, oh, thank you. Right, where 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 will you be next? Nothing uh, planned yet as far as actual speaking. So we'll see. Um okay. we've been invited to that one actually that Tony we were just at. Um uh <laughs> the full disclosure now conference. They'd actually Brian said uh they'd they'd like us to be on there if, or he he'd definitely invite us on if if we wanted to or we'll see see how that looks so we'll see we'll see um yeah. but i think for sure there's so much more we can, can oh, yeah. discuss yeah um yeah. but we we've had other confirmations and one that one that said they directly channeled to our grandfather so you know we take that also with a grain of salt but a lot of their information does uh have a lot of similarities and 
I feel like it's hard to tell, you know, was it him speaking or when it's talking? I kind of did in a sense feel like he was kind of to the point. He was kind of, there's like no emotion. There's no like, you know, getting emotional about things. It's just like, he was almost like with that person and they don't want to be disclosed because actually our grandfather said, don't disclose this person's name. If you're going to talk to me and get information from me, I don't, I don't want them getting in trouble for it. And it's like, he's already still in that mindset of like this, you shouldn't be here. Like I shouldn't be talking to you because this could have consequences. So mm-hmm. like, that's the read, the initial reading was like that. And the wow. things that he shared was like, basically there's disappointment for the fact that disclosure hasn't happened yet. Like he just seemed frustrated. Like we're still at this point or not. It, it hasn't been out in the open. And his message before he left too on video was like, if we don't speak about this, you know, if we don't start saying that the aliens are going to show up and they're going to, they're going to want the truth out one way or another. So mm-hmm. he was kind of just saying um, he's frustrated. It's at this point, he knows that the truth will eventually come. And maybe he warned, he, he almost gave us a warning. Like, don't feel like you have to be the ones on the front lines to get it out. Like you, wow. you don't, don't feel like you have to, cause it's going to come out. But I think at the same time, <laughs> We, we, we don't want to wait around forever. Like there's a, there's, there's a reason we're here and there's a reason why we're on this path. I think it only makes sense to, 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 to help the rest of the world come to the same conclusions where we should be. Right. Yeah. With disclosures. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. I hope, I hope you guys keep pushing and spreading all of this. It's, it's really incredible information. Yeah. Well, thank you. Thank yeah. You. Thank you guys so much. You know, we're, yeah, we're really excited to continue we're on this journey. We appreciate all your support. And uh, yeah, this was a fascinating experience for us, for sure. So thank yeah. you. Yeah. And then where can we find you, Tony? And I know you have some things coming up and, or Veronica too. Like, what, Yeah, please share. Um, so TonyRodriguez.com links to my Patreon. I, it's on Patreon that I teach the remote viewing the groups. And it's been a great fun. And I've, recently shuffled it around to accommodate more people because it started getting out of control. So I, I changed the format so that I, more people can join and it still be just as effective. Everybody gets their time. And um, so that's through Patreon talks with Tony, but it links from my website, Tony And um, that's what I've been doing after my book, you know, my research into my own account of annual current, the first stop in my 20 and back that I went through, the evidence I dug up really fueled that book. And then the remote viewing is, is uh, part of it and remote influencing and a lot mm-hmm. of other countermeasures to remote viewing. There's a lot to it. And I, you know, I discovered quite a bit and then I'm doing some talks. I have a uh, Sedona uh, odyssey, Sedona.com. And it's got a funky spelling like O D Y S S E Y Sedona.com. And that's my conference. And I'm going to have some Farsight remote viewers, Yummy, Janae, and Aziz Brown are going to be guests. Jackie Kenner is a medium, and she's going to be there. Lily Nova is very good at leading meditations. And it's about meditation and how you unlock the abilities and remote viewing, the mechanics of it. That It's a one-day conference in Sedona. I'm having that in October. I'll be speaking at uh, the GSIC, the Galactic Spiritual Informers Connection Conference in Denver uh, next month. And I'm excited about that one. That's always, a, I always learn more than I ever share there. That's a great okay. conference. And this year as it's shaping up, there's going to be some, some cool disclosures this year that, you know, you know, that are going to come out, like some, some new things are going to come out. So my conference is geared around the remote viewing in Sedona and um, looking forward to that. And then the GSIC one is next. And then it's, I've got another conference and I forget the name of it. I apologize in um, North Dakota. And then some international ones coming up. So I'm traveling. This year I went to Europe and spoke in front of a crowd that didn't speak English. And uh, it went well. I, you know, they didn't throw tomatoes. So, um, <laughs> But the information is growing. What I'm saying is what we are doing is growing. So yeah. it's catching on, even though, even though it's clear that the powers that be are trying to silence it. We are shadow banned. Um, but people are catching on to this because it's the truth. That's the thing. So if people need to hear the truth. It heals you. And so as it spreads, it's, it just takes hold. So we're, it is growing what's going on. So it's very good, uh, very good stuff. So when people that ask, I show up, that's, uh, that's it. That's my rule. I'm not out marketing myself other than what I just did here, but I don't really market and try to go. People ask me to tell my story or to help out and I do it. Wow. Amazing. So we great. look forward to seeing some of those places. I know it's going to be, yeah, great information. And Veronica, 
Can we find you anywhere? Yeah, um, I do uh, psychic readings um, of all kinds on my website at uh, spacemystic.com. And I'm expanding that practice. I did kind of a, a practicum of sorts for a couple of years and um, and launching into some new new realms there. And uh, Isla will keep remote viewing and working with Tony and his uh, motives group and all the projects there. And I'll be completing a book soon. Um, it's taken a lot longer uh, as I had more and more memories come back of repressed memories. So I'm putting all those pieces together slowly and finishing this book. Awesome. Great. Yeah. Very cool. Well, we right, guys, really well, do appreciate all yeah. that you did for us. Yeah, it really means yeah. a lot to us in our journey and finding out answers about our grandfather. So thank you so That's much. Great. My pleasure. Great to see you. Thanks, Thanks, guys. Thanks, guys. Now, I want you to answer this. What I've told you, is it going to make any difference in your life? You better wake up, better change, get interested, changing your life.